Henry James called Uncle Tom's Cabin the American novel that made the most noise in the world. A large, broad-chested, powerfully made man of a full glossy black and a face whose truly African features were characterized by an expression of grave and steady good sense united with much kindliness and benevolence. There was something about his whole air, self-respecting and dignified, yet united with a confiding and humble simplicity. This was Stowe's Uncle Tom, and it inflamed many of her readers north and south that she had made a black man intelligent. She went further, claiming that slaves were perhaps better Christians than white Americans. She meant to provoke. The surprise of her book is not what she says about slavery. Her fiction is, of course, much milder than the historical truth. But its religiosity, her fervor, the zeal of his house hath eaten me up. The battle of the books was over, Edmund Wilson said, and by 1900, Uncle Tom's Cabin was impossible to find in bookstores. But for black writers at the turn of the century, this battle was far from over. The defeat of the Confederacy had not meant the end of the plantation tradition. If anything, the defeat of Reconstruction ushered in the sentimental portraits of the South that have been a part of American entertainment and popular culture ever since. The dialect story enjoyed renewed popularity around at the turn of the century uh, through the folk tales retold by Joel Chandler Harris's narrator, Uncle Remus. He is a revision of Uncle Tom. Tom told Eva stories and sang hymns to her, but there was never a twinkle in his eye. When we think of Uncle Tom, we see his usurper, Uncle Remus, with his wizened face and bald crown, the old darky. But Mrs. Stowe had meant for Uncle Tom to die in his prime powerful Christian martyr and a moral instructor to the nation. I have read this book three times. Um, once uh, in 94, once in about 99, and once just a few weeks ago. And each time I am struck anew by the broadness of Harriet Beecher Stowe's canvas. And not just the geographical broadness, but the thematic broadness. So this time I made a list of um, two things. The issues that uh, Stowe addresses and the modes of resistance that she depicts. Um, the issues that she addresses, and very straightforwardly and giving them a good deal of space, are one, capitalism, two, religion, three, slavery, including labor, sex, breeding, abuse, betrayal of good intentions. <coughs> Four, racism, as represented by Ophelia's initial response to Topsy, and Alfred St. Clair's assertion of inherent racial superiority. Five, power relationships. Six, very big one here, male-female or husband-wife relationships. Seven, regional differences in ways of organizing domestic life and eight, the proper education of any human being. That's a lot to do, even in 450 pages. That's very ambitious. Um, she also talks about possible resistance to the institution of slavery. And this really struck me this time. Um, one, Eliza tries escaping and succeeds. George, Eliza's husband, tries armed resistance, but also education. Um, Andy, who works for um, the family in Kentucky, does deception and um, under, undermining of various uh, instructions that he's given. Um, Tom uh, does the, does the um, resistance of transcendence, separation of the soul and body, spiritual resistance. Um, Lucy, a woman whose child is taken from her on the ship, commits suicide. Um, St. Clair in New Orleans uh, is resistant to slavery, but it's all argument and logic with him rather than action. And Cassie, who is my favorite character, um, intelligence, emotional manipulation, knowledge of the enemy, <coughs> um, and there's this interesting connection between the way she does things and the rise of Gothic literature, the popularity of Gothic literature in her day, which she takes advantage of in order to um, uh, un undermine Simon Legree. 
Um, so for me, um, I don't see how she could have added anything other than war. You know, <laughs> she, they go all over the country, um, at least all over the eastern half of the country, and they try everything um, to to uh, avert, subvert, and um, work against the institution of slavery. To me, this is incredibly ambitious. And um, it is not in any way a kind of um, sentimental um, acknowledgement of the existence of this institution. So it's her, to me, it's her imagination um, really working hard to comprehend all the ways that this institution affects the world that she lives in. And including religion, including religion, institutionalized religion. Um, so because Great Aunt Hattie, which is what we called her, um, was a member of the family, I stayed away from this book for a long time. Um, it was too risky for me to read it because it was my mother's family, and they were very proud of her. But I knew, as soon as I got to school, that, that this book was held in contempt by the world of literature. So for me to read it, particularly since I wanted to be a writer, was very challenging. Because if I read it and despised it, what was I going to say to my mother? Um, and what was it going to mean for me as a writer if this was my inheritance? So I, I really just stayed away from it until a couple of years ago when two of my friends, who are very smart and also both writers themselves, um, heard that I have the family connection and said, you, you have to read it. It's a great book. So I, that was very heartening. And so I risked it, um, prepared to be really disappointed and, and to feel that I had come down in a, a, from a family of low-grade writers. <laughs> <laughs> And I was enormously relieved and pleased to find a book that was, um, it, you can argue about the work in terms of literature. It may not be, it, I mean, I would not say it was as great as War and Peace, but it is a, it's, so it may not be a work of great literature, but I will stand behind it and defend it as a great, as a work of great moral courage. Um, for somebody who was, mostly unknown. I think Stowe had written a few local sketches before she started this incredibly ambitious work. She, she may have written some novels, but she was not a well-known national writer. She had no platform. She wasn't well accepted. Um, she wasn't a literary figure in any large way. And to take on this subject at that time in our history was an act of extraordinary bravery, I think. One of the things that interests me is religion, and everyone here tonight has talked about it. And I think it's it's both a source of great strength in the book, and also a, it's a, it's a kind of obfuscating fog because religion today is viewed so differently from the way it was at the time when she wrote this. It's also a question of family culture, and my family, the Beechers, were all religious. And Harriet's father, Lyman Beecher, was a famous religious proselytizer and sort of fiery preacher. Most of his sons were ministers. My great-great-great-grandfather, Henry Ward Beecher, was a minister. His daughter married my great-grandfather, also a minister. It goes on and on. Our family's infested with ministers. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all incredibly morally righteous. And I recently met a distant cousin of Beecher. <coughs> And within 20 minutes, he had pulled out a self-published book on how to lead a moral life. <laughs> <laughs> so there is this culture within the family. Um, and so the reason I say this is because Hattie felt totally confident. Her husband also was a minister and a student of her father's. Um, she felt incredibly confident and safe within a world that it's hard for us to imagine today. Or maybe it's not for you. but. We live in a pretty secular society, particularly in, on the coast. For a while. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that may all change in November. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the literary culture of today is not particularly driven by religion. And um, we don't have the same sense. We don't have the same kind of education. People, children are not asked to memorize um, the Psalms or the scriptures. They, they don't all go to 
Sunday school, but at Hattie's time, all children that she thought were well brought up learned the scriptures. Everybody knew the quotes. Certainly everyone in her family did. My point is that I think this gave her a platform. And this was what gave her the strength to attack some, this enormous institution that had the entire country in its thrall. But Hattie knew that there was something larger than the country, larger than this institution, larger than the economy, which was the spiritual world, which she was completely convinced by. And everyone she knew was completely convinced by. So that gave her a kind of a vehicle and a tool and a weapon and a conviction that she, I don't think she would have had without that. So that gave her this incredible sense of power. But it also, as time went on and religion came to play a smaller and smaller role in American life, as Jane describes so beautifully in her <coughs> essay, she writes about the way this, this book came into decline and the way Huckleberry Finn sort of took over in the literary world. Um, and I think that has to do with religion, and religion became less and less prominent, less and less, and pe people, intellectuals, wanted less and less to talk about it. They didn't want to think about it, they didn't want to think literature was involved with religion, and it just became more and more uncomfortable. Today, when you read this book, when I read it, I tend to skim the passages about scripture. They don't mean much to me, I don't feel the same response that she did. But for her, they were enormously powerful. And then, in starting the say, 40s and 50s of the last century, they became much more problematic for American intellectuals to deal with. So I think that has something to do with the decline of this book. And now, um, for the last 30 years or so, with people like Daryl and Jane, it has been rescued, thank goodness, for my family. <laughs> <laughs> I do, you know, as, as I was preparing for the panel, I tried to find the earliest reference to the character of Uncle Tom in a pejorative fashion. The earliest one that I saw was 1919, the Marcus Garvey. Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass. And what did he have to well, say? It's not necessarily derogatory, but I think that uh, black people minded the book in many ways from the beginning okay. for little things. Tom was eight years older than George Shelby. The day he sells him, he keeps calling him boy. You're a good boy, you're a good boy. Um, Tom actually has no psychology or no interior apart from his religion. Uh, uh, um, and so Frederick Douglass was saying that uh, uh, in 1857 uh, that blacks would not sort of passively embrace reward in the next world, that they will sort of arm and, and fight sort of mind at that kind of a, having to behave better than white people. They uh, not going to do it. So. I wondered about the, 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 those two things in, in tandem, the perception of um, Tom's passivity in relationship to um, Harry Beecher Stowe's notion of religion. It, it seems as if she she's not in her Worldview. Is she making him passive she's or is she making him Christian? She's I making him blameless. No, I think she makes him Christ. I think she makes him Christ. He makes a choice, and the choice is for the for his soul. Right. Yeah. And um, I think she's she lost that. everything else, and so yeah. he's not going to lose God. But I think he would have, even if he hadn't lost everything yeah. else, he has. He has really gone through the stages of the cross. I think she sees that he as. When he leaves and goes down the river, these are the stages of the cross. And um, at each stage, he has something of a choice. And finally, there is that time at the very the, the, the last scene where he is asked to renounce his savior. And he says, I cannot do that. And Legree. But this has been a theme in black yeah. life always. Do you turn the other cheek? Do you find? <coughs> so this just well, did Jesus turn the other cheek? <coughs> the, but they're not thinking like you know. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Like I, yeah. I'm just saying that um, I think she sees this as a heroic. I think she explicitly sees this as a heroic yes. yeah. self-sacrifice yeah. from the beginning um, yes. in the model of yes. Jesus which, Christ, which yeah. figures like Frederick Douglass then rejected. Yeah, but okay. We were talking upstairs. <coughs> Stowe herself became more radical as, we, as the crisis in the nation intensified. 
Mm -hmm. And so she was very much in support of John Brown, mm -hmm. even though in the novel she wrote after Uncle Tom's Cabin about a black slave rebellion, she couldn't do it because she couldn't bring herself to make blacks kill whites. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's that's her or some understanding of her public, mm -hmm. but even in or Uncle Tom's Cabin, or publisher, <laughs> even in Uncle Tom's Cabin, <laughs> she's very careful in a way to sort of, um, you know, Uncle Tom is, is, is this martyr, but George and Eliza Harris can't remain in the United States. Mm -hmm. She can't imagine the social destiny of free blacks, so she has to send them to Liberia. Mm -hmm. So I think the book ends with a lot of open questions. I think that's true. But it's not about black people, it's about slavery. Mm -hmm. I, but I also, when I first read it, and it strikes me still every time I read it, um, that the character of Cassie disappeared from American mm -hmm. lore and literature. Cassie is one of the strongest, most interesting, knowledgeable, and intelligent female characters I think has ever been created in America. She beats him at their own game. She beats him at his Sorry. own game, but <laughs> she she also she's um, she's sexual. She is a you know she's a grown up woman, um, and. She is just is in despair, so she's having an existential crisis. She tries to talk Tom into resistance, and she realizes that's not going to work. And so she uses her intelligence to figure out a way to terrify Legree so that she can save the young woman who Legree intends to make his sexual slave. Um, and so, in, in, uh, you know, is she heroic? I don't know, but she, she sure is smart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she's smart and, and funny. She's so funny the way she, um, the way she does her plot and, and terrifies him um, by playing upon his fears of ghosts. And so she makes noises happen upstairs, and she, um, and she. I, I don't know. I love her. And when I was, when I was reading the book the first time, I said, "What happened to her?" Why did she engender no, no female character? In fact, because she's killed one of her children, born in slavery, so it won't be brought up a slave. Um, so you think? So you think it's that? It's and then also, Stowe doesn't punish her. She, you no, know, that's what pretends to be pretends to be a great lady with the girl she's rescuing, uh -huh. pretending to be her servant. They get on the steamer, they go up the Red River, and they make it to Cincinnati, and she goes to Canada. Stowe doesn't punish her. And uh, there's a book called Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, mm -hmm. published in 1862 mm -hmm. by Harriet Jacobs. And this is a woman who uh, picked one white guy in order not to have the terrible white guy, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, 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 hid in her grandmother's attic for seven years in Virginia, mm -hmm. and smuggled, had black seamen smuggle letters out to New York who would then mail them back so they would think she had escaped. And her narrative is filled with her torment that she's had sexual relations out of wedlock, had children out of wedlock, has made these decisions that she had to as a woman. Uh, and she's beating herself up the entire time. And Stowe never does that to any of the women characters. She was so taken with what they had to go through uh, as enslaved women, that they had no choices, that she was sort of always on their side. Well, she's always, and I, I think goes back to your list, she's always playing with the idea um, with subverting <coughs> people's ideas of both oppression and resistance. Yeah. I mean, not only the ways that, um, that um, the black slaves can resist their owners and resist their lot, but also that, you know, that notion that, okay, Christianity is in a way because of Catholic care, way to oppress, you know, that you move in and convert, and then people will be happy and docile. And she subverts that, I think, as well. Well, and she, she takes she, up she, the issue of what, what is religion if, if, this, if this evil person is spouting religion, if this evil person okay. is using religion to make people do what he wants. It, you know, I, I love, every so often, I, there's, a, there's a quote where she likens the behavior of a particular slave like Andy at the beginning to a politician in Washington, D.C. To us, that doesn't seem very subversive, and we just laugh. Mm -hmm. But 
to her, for her in that day. She, knew, she, said, she knew exactly mm -hmm. that she was <coughs> poking, you know. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you think of that, Roxanne? I mean, it, you know, she's saying, she's not giving the country an out. She's not saying, well, Tom is a good Christian and therefore, you know, in the next life, these people will be rewarded, so then slavery is okay. She's saying, no, that's beside the point. Slavery is still a horrendously evil institution, and, and uh, that we can't use Christianity to excuse it, or the idea of a next life. And I, it seems to me, it, the thing you feel through the book so strongly is she really, truly believes that the better life is the next life. But she wants this life to be good for everyone, too. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say, I think religion is maybe her only blind spot. We've been talking about the, the fact that she sees the, the, um, the deep flaws on every level of anybody who supports slavery. But I don't think she sees religion as an oppressive system. She certainly recognizes that there are ministers who preach a way to embrace slavery, and she mm -hmm. sees the fraudulence of that. Yeah. But I don't think she sees the religion that she knows as oppressive. I think she does think that that gives people solace, it gives people a kind of benison while they're alive, slaves, whites, anyone. And she, yes, I do think she believes in the, in the other. Like, and, and she she talks about Christ all the time in a way that, mm, well, growing up in a Protestant family, Christ is not such a presence as, as it was for her. So Christ is really the, the constant figure. So I, I don't, my sense is that she doesn't see, see that as, as oppressive, that her system. Mm -hmm. No, I think she felt that the nation's soul was in peril. And slavery had been a religious argument from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, Slaveholders in the 18th century argued over whether to uh, introduce um, Christianity and the Bible to enslaved Africans. Uh, uh, it had been that knowledge of God was the thing that uh, separated men from animals, but then when it turned out that illiterate slaves could know God, then they sort of had to change the rules and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the religion, there's lots in the Bible that justified slavery. All of Paul, uh, stuff like that. Uh, your family was in the middle of this sort of Swedenborg, you know, sort of uh, 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 I don't know what to call it, evangelical fervor. Uh, uh, and uh, the Lane Seminary in Cincinnati, Ohio, that Lyman Beecher was hit up, was a real hotbed of this kind of religious argument about slavery. Lyman Beecher himself was a gradualist. And uh, 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 I think some of uh, uh, Mrs. Stowe's friends were sort of demanding much more in terms of uh, 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 working with blacks and uh, was there a split in the school? There was a split, yeah. well, mm -hmm. sort of over it. So, you know, she was uh, engaged in this, um, what seems to us a religious argument was for her inseparable from the political uh, uh, in that I, way. I think that's true, and, that, and I think that brings us to the question of who is little Eva? Um, because there is She's a- She's horrible. No, you're <laughs> wrong. Oh, there is okay. a section. There is, I was just trying to find the quote. <laughs> but there, there is a section where she basically says, I cannot live in this world. Mm -hmm. And it's right toward her, her father. I, I think um, her father is an extremely interesting character because in his mind he's against slavery, but he's never acted. Um, in any way, um, except to kind of be as kind as he can to his slaves. Mm -hmm. And um, and so he's constantly arguing in his mind, and she's the only thing in the world that he loves. And, and there is this <clears throat> moment that I wish I could find where she basically says, I cannot, I cannot live in this world. I would prefer to be dead than to live in the world that you adults have made. I would prefer to be dead. And is that what you want your child to say? You know, to me this is a great, um, this is not about the poor child, you know, floating off into the cosmos, um, sort of showing us all, you know, some transcendent way to go. It is about a child 
recognizing the evil of the world and understanding it. So, um, <laughs> so I think there's a lot going on with little Eva that we don't um, to, yeah, acknowledge. That's an interesting point. Um, but it's hard to conceive. <laughs> can't argue. Do you want to weigh in on that? No, I think that's a brilliant way to portray yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. True. And so yeah, she's, she's talking to us. <laughs> <laughs> but she's not. She's not that the only, you know, golden child who becomes an angel in 19th century. Right. Absolutely not. They're all over the place, aren't they? <laughs> and the well, one child I Child mortality. Was yeah, was yeah. I thought not so much of. Um, of uh, Mel, but I thought of Paul Dombey in mm -hmm. Dombey and Son, who is kind of a childhood saint. Mm -hmm. um, little women. They're, they're dying. Oh, yeah. They're uh, dying. Uh, they're dying. They're Yeah. Yeah. Little <laughs> yeah. 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 girls, so they're always these. Yeah. These I'm going to read, I'm going to read this book just okay. be, to sure, be sure I get it in. This is from um, uh, St. Clair is talking and um, he, he says, uh, uh, well now, but I'm not sure after all about this religion, said he, the old wicked expression returning to his eye. The country is almost ruined with pious white people. Such <laughs> pious politicians we have just before elections. Such <laughs> pious goings on in all departments of church and state that a fellow does not know who will cheat him next. <laughs> <laughs> so you tell me that she doesn't know how religion works in this country. She, it's interesting, she lets no one off the hook. No right? way. The exactly. Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 had made everyone complicit yeah. one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, that e people in the North who've been distant, you know, suddenly they were involved, you're acting or not acting had, mm -hmm. you know, sort of consequences. She makes Simon Legree a native of Vermont, mm -hmm. just so there's no, the North is good, the South is bad. Mm -hmm. And she lets no class off of it, which is why uh, Mr. Shelby and uh, uh, this Augustine guy mm -hmm. are sort of shown as, you know, okay, they may have decent impulses, but when the chips are down, yeah. what's, what's the there's point of <coughs> Exactly. And she makes, um, and, and um, Simon Legree is from Vermont, and I always remember this sec little section that I noticed the first time. She talks about who's making the money off the slaves, too, and it's Northerners, yeah. Yeah. and it's not <coughs> Southerners. So that's part of her critique of capitalism mm -hmm. and her perfect understanding. I, I mean, the beginning, we usually think of the beginning as maybe the lead-up to little Eva and Simon Legree, but in fact, it's, it's a very interesting analysis of the slave trade and the justifications that the <coughs> slave traders make for um, being in this business mm -hmm. and um, you know and and you hear it all the time from people in you know the hog killing business it's it's exactly the same thing it hasn't changed you know well other people do it other people do it worse than I do I try to be good I try to do it right you know it's it's bargaining with sin in order to make money and it is a it is a capitalist trade mm -hmm. and she gets and she her analysis of that is is very interesting and good and i so it's not that she sort of winds up to the simon mm -hmm. Legree part it's that she begins uh and she stretches her analysis over the whole nation from the yeah. Right, and even in, in the, you're right, in the initial scene, he's not off the hog, Shelley. I mean, he's... No, he's in debt. He's yeah. Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, and so, you know, he's, he's complicit, definitely complicit, in, and the good master is not something she wants to engage as, as, as being an excuse.